Hey guys, Leanna here. It is Tata's Tuesday. And because it's Tata's Tuesday, we're talking about a women's issue. And this is uh, a topic that actually, you know, the lightning kind of struck my brain while playing Fallout 4. And what it basically was is that I encountered my um, third female companion in a row that was sort of a B cup and brown hair. And went, what is going on here? Why do all the women I can travel with look so identically? And then I started thinking about this trend in video games of dealing with women as a class. And this is something that has been promoted by uh, certain prominent feminists in video games. They are anti-choice feminists in that they do not believe in... Um, a woman's right to individual decisions that make her happy as a good feminist. We're supposed to think of the whole when we make our decisions and think about what is good for women. And apparently in my case, what's good for women is a breast reduction and hair dye. I'm not going to do that. Um, but women as a class is difficult because when we talk about identity, you can see in this website about class, we talk about gender, race, and class. Those are the, the three big ones before, um, you know, sexuality comes into it. These are identifiable things. And the problem with treating women as a class is that there are various classes at work within feminism, within, you know, womanhood, the womanosphere, so to speak. That's a really hard word to say. Let's never do that again. Um, but there are upper class women who have different needs and challenges than, than, you know, middle class or poor women. There are women in the developed world that have decidedly different challenges than women without access to safe drinking water. And to bundle women into a class negates the classes that striate feminism. But there are other elements of women as class that are important when you look, when you, you know, that's within womanhood. That's within the 50 to 51% of the population at any given point that is female. But when you look at the issue, like legal issues or political issues of gender discrimination, then we get into the question of women as class in a completely different way. And that was best shown during the Walmart lawsuit. And this raged for 10 years, this lawsuit, 10 years from filing, actually more than that, because it started in 2001, it ended as a class action in 2013, and it's still going because of the outcome there. The outcome was that the, the federal courts determined that women as a class are too big to be considered a class. Therefore, they couldn't launch a class action suit because female Walmart employees could not launch a class action suit because the only thing they had in common was that they were women. And of course, the accusation is that they're being paid unfairly and denied promotions, et cetera, et cetera, as, as uh, you know, accord, uh, compared to men. It would have been the largest workplace bias case he, in U.S. history. And the funny thing about this ruling is that the, the primary reason that I understand for class action suits is, is to cut down the load on the courts, uh, the, the cost to taxpayers, as well as, as the cost to people bringing and defending against suits. And what ended up happening because these female Walmart employees weren't able to be heard as a class action case, 2,000 individual women <laughs> launched court cases uh, against Walmart. So Walmart now has to deal with 2,000 cases instead of one. And this is, this is where you start to see that this whole idea of women as a distinct class, it's kind of like the light, what light is to physics. Um, women are to sort of uh, political or the political arena or the, the, you know, the social arena. I won't call it social justice because that's duh now. 
I already have enough problems with people say, why do you identify as a feminist? Um, I, I don't ha wanna have to deal with the social justice thing too. But light behaves like a particle and a wave. And it's interesting to think about the female gender um, as, as a similar thing in social spheres. Sometimes it behaves like a distinct class. And that's usually in terms of gender discrimination or, or some other thing, you know, voting rights. Uh, women, you know, fought as as a as a class, as a group, to get voting rights for all, otherwise known as universal suffrage. Uh, but then there are other times that women don't work as a class at all, and when we get into creative endeavors. That's when we get sort of the wave theory of women as opposed to the particle theory of, or maybe I should say the other way around. Women as class is like a light, light acting like a wave. Women as individuals act like light as a particle. And when we get into creativity, working with a group as a class instead of a collection of individuals gets really tricky. And the classic example when it doesn't work out so well is, I know heresy, the writing of J.R.R. Tolkien. Most people cannot tell the difference between the elves, not the elves, the dwarves in The Hobbit. We know who the elf guy is because he's Legolas' father and we all know Legolas from The Lord of the Rings. But we continue to need drawings with names other than Killy and most people don't know his name. We know him as, you know, the hot dwarf. Um, and Tolkien didn't make enough distinctions between members of his races because he treated races as sort of these across the board classes. Elves behave like elves, dwarves behave like dwarves, orcs behave like orcs, goblins behave like goblins, and the various factions of man, the, the riders of Rohan, the rangers, etc., all sort of behave determinately based on their affiliation. And it led to some pretty flat characters that Peter Jackson's team had to go out of their way to try to differentiate. I mean, Legolas has blonde hair compared to, you know, Elrond who has dark hair and, and that's, you know, that's a, a visual thing to tell them apart. Now, obviously Legolas became a very different character than Elrond, but that's sort of the exception that proves the rule. Legolas didn't really have a ton to do in the first three movies, he got expanded in The Hobbit, which is weird because he wasn't even in the books. But this is an example of what happens when you treat, um, you know, a, an entire group in fiction as a class. Now, because women are such a big group. I mean, that whole thing, you're too big to be considered a class, too big to class. Now we get a phenomenon within gaming where because of political influences, creators are being encouraged to see women as a collective group instead of individual characters that have to be interesting and compelling in their own right. And notice I did not say likable. Because one of the side effects of women as class is this idea that every female character you create has to be likable. Because every single female character you create is an embodiment of their entire bloody race. Which is the entire reason we complain about Smurfette syndrome in the first place. So now we have multiple female characters in a game. Which are somewhat indistinguishable from each other because they're so limited in what they can do and what they're allowed to be that what's so what it's more of the same it's a it's a freaking kick line we're we're back to the the rockets without any sequins or or cute shoes um and that's a real problem and that directly comes from treating women as a class and like i said it works great in sociology models, but as a creative model, it's lousy. Because when you're creating something, every single character people are gonna spend any time with 
have to be an individual. And that means taking off the reins and doing some things that are sometimes politically incorrect, right? I mean, the classic example is the Lara Croft makeover. And she has become so indistinct that some people are confusing her for Katniss from the Hunger Games. And if you actually think about it, Katniss did have the bow first. And it, Lara Croft used to be, you know, pouty lips, the bl- brown ponytail, the, the you know, uh, strained in the chest, uh, teal green shirt, shorts, and the two pistols. Now she has no color in her outfit and she's got a bow and arrow. And, you know, if you want to get into that whole thing, uh, you know, Oh, of course she has a bow and arrow. That's the natural role for women in combat, distance fighting, right? I'm not going to go there because she always had projectile weapons. But the the act of going chung, 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 you know, uh, with the boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's it's certainly more macho, isn't it? To be going boom, 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 all John Woo style than a bow and arrow. Um, that's not to slight a bow and arrow. I mean, Katniss manages to be awesome, but we're getting this convergence of female characters. And I'm going to get a little teeny bit spoilery when it comes to Fallout right now, but this is, this is sort of a critical point. Uh, and it's the best example I can think of right now to explain why this sort of treating women as an amorphous mass through class designation as opposed to individual characters is leading to boring ass female characters. This is Nick Valentine, who to me is one of the coolest companion characters in uh, Fallout 4, up there with Hancock and uh, Dogmeat. Um, and the reason Nick is cool is he's a, a shining example of the change one thing rule. They've taken the traditional straight up, you know, kind of gumshoe detective with the worn trench coat and the fedora from those old like pulp crime novels and those radio serials and made him a robot or what they call in Fallout for a synth. And the change one thing rule is change one thing, you're a genius, change two things, you're a bad genius, change three things, it's never going to work. And Nick Valentine works because he is a machine. He looks so uncanny valley, right? He's got a, a very um, distinct face where he has a face. And then there's gears and glowing eyes. And especially when it's in the dark and you turn around like, wow, Nick, warn a guy. But he's so human in his own way. And it's right down to that noir revenge fiction trope and I started going why why can't we just have the female equivalent of a character like this like why can't we just take a beloved trope and um make it into something cool and fresh and a different take on it well it's because thanks to this idea of women as class and us having to do things for the greater group instead of creating interesting and distinct individuals all our tropes that women can draw from to create a character like Nick Valentine um, are suddenly demonized. So the, the counterpart to this sort of crime noir character for, that Nick Valentine embodies is the femme fatale, which you experience in Fallout 4 through voice, like radio serials. But... You can't do those characters in video games anymore because someone has determined they offend women as a class. And so all that, you know, bad girl, good girl pinup, all that girl Friday, anything you assign a trope to is now bad. And I mean, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a a ghoul femme fatale who, uh, you know, had this radio persona and she was all vampy and sexy and, and, you know, guys fantasized about her because nobody knew she was a ghoul. Now, you know, wouldn't it be interesting in sort of a Sunset Boulevard kind of thing? But then, you know, you'd have to give her big boobs in an evening gown and, oh, women is class. No, 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 you're oppressing us. 
And so that's all well and good. You're, you're emancipating us so out of the ability to be interesting characters. And this is when I start going, you know, light theory of feminism, guys. <sighs> Women are a wave and a particle. Women are a class, but we are also individuals. And we're not going to get the cool characters until we stop worrying so much about class in the creative sphere and worry more about individuals in the creative sphere. And this goes for male characters too. I mean, there's a lot of developers who are saying it loud and proud. Why does every male character in a video game have to be a gun-toting Yahoo? You know, why can't we get another Alan Wake where he didn't have a melee attack because he was a noodly armed writer? You know, why can't we get more games where it's sort of, um, I mean, the, the character I felt horribly sorry for was the father in Heavy Rain who was just sort of going on this journey of self-torture because he wasn't, you know, built for combat. He was just a dad. And I would like more of those characters. I would like to see more diversity in the male characters, but diversity and raw number representation are different challenges. You know, you can have four women in a game, but if they're indistinguishable from each other, then we get then we get dwarf syndrome again. You know, Tolkien dwarf syndrome again, where you could tell the hobbits apart from the beginning, even though there were four of them, because they were distinct personalities and they were introduced sort of one by one, or in, you know, Merry and Pippin's uh, case, the two of them. But we got to know Frodo, we got to know Sam, we got to know Mary, we got to know Pippin. The dwarves moved as this mass. And you can't get to know people as individuals, except for the cute one that fell in love with the elf. And, you know, sorry, spoiler for people who uh, um, didn't see the movie yet. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a creative issue. And when it comes to creativity, you have to put good characters first because we're not going to get Lara Croft selling games if people confuse her with Katniss. We need characters that are immediately identifiable and instantly recognizable and not the female equivalent of the bald space marine or brown hair McNormal pants. I call these characters like in, in the, the new NU Lara Croft school, you know, brown hair McPonytail because we get them over and over and over again. Why? Because brown hair is safe. Bear the connotations of blonde hair or, you know, red hair. And if you make a skin a little dark, well, she could be biracial, she could be something different, you know, but no, it's, it's just that girl next door brown hair, every video game character is turning into Sandra freaking Bullock, okay? And they, people claim, people think, that is for a female audience. But when uh, I'm out there and, you know, when I was in North Carolina uh, with Trisha Hirschberger, also from The Escapist, Trisha had her pinup art stuff out. And yes, Trisha is a brunette, but she's also in this like smoking red hot bikini with these cute little heels and watering a Minecraft flower. And, and people came by and so many women came by and talked about how beautiful they think pinup art is. Well, pin up aesthetic, the focus on an individual woman in one scene at one place in time, that type of femininity is blown out of the water by women as class. And that's why if we want to create compelling individual women, which is what the video game industry has done with these great male characters, they create great male characters one character at a time. And the enduring ones stand out in part because they look distinct. But if we're trying to compel all our female characters into alignment with a class that obliterates distinction, that's conformity. And then we wonder why games don't sell and we wonder why people don't latch onto these characters and we get so fixated on, oh, we have to make her likable. Oh God, we have to make her likable. Well, likability is very subjective, so all you get is mush. And that is the problem facing female characters in video games today. And I think 
It comes down to this idea of women as class instead of women as individuals. So game developers who are listening, throw out the idea that you have to make a character for all women the same way you throw out the idea that you're making a character for all men, okay? You don't design characters for all men to like. You go for a specific subsection, right? So stop doing it to women. Stop trying to make everybody like Lara Croft. Stop trying to make everybody like the, the, the spunky girl reporter that's Piper in Fallout 4. Stop doing that. Give us some people who are unlikable at first, like a violent, raging murderer like Kratos that we then find there's more to him. Those complexities are what make people compelled by a character. And if you're afraid to give female characters complexity because you might offend, you are not going to create lasting female characters. You're going to create a bunch of dwarves from The Hobbit that no one can tell apart.